I said, I gotta go pee. <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Amen. Well, how many of you were blessed by Miss Elizabeth? I kept thinking I should have made her the finale. <laughs> but before I jump into my message this morning, uh, this is our last opportunity to just sew in to, to this time together. So we're going to have our ushers uh, pass out envelopes. But, you know, we, when we look at this time that there's things that God is seeding into our hearts, isn't he? Uh, I was talking to one of my friends during the line uh, here, and she said, uh, so how's the conference? And she said, it's like open heart surgery. And then her friend said, with no anesthesia. <laughs> That's awesome. Because when God does open heart surgery and he pulls out stuff, he's like, hey, look, there's a screwdriver in your heart. Look, there's a toothpick. He could just start taking off out all of these mentalities or hooks of the devil. And he just, he starts just transforming us. Amen. How many of you, um, again, this was your first time ever here at Karis Bible College campus-wise? Amen. We have been so privileged to have you here. We invite you back now that you've tasted this. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> so uh, talk to another lady, uh, Sonia. She got spear-filled on the first night. Sonia got spear-filled on the first night, got saved a year ago. Amen, Tanya. She said this is the first Christian conference she's ever been to. Wow. You came to a doozy. I mean, like, come on, let's go straight for the jugular. Yes. I'm so excited. Amen. Well, you know, as we take it this time for, for um, offering, you know, a lot of people will avoid offering talks because they... You know, they don't, or they don't want to be the one to take up the offering because they feel like they're trying to convince people to give them the money and, you know, this is a Christian thing and, oh, we just got to convince you to do it. Let's hurry up and get through it. It's just kind of this tradition. No, this is a huge part of the ministry time, ladies. This is a major important principle because in finances, it's just as much warfare that can happen in our finances. Amen? And the enemy is after our finances, because in those finances, then there's the stress and the pressure and the feeling like the, just the, the spirit of lack, right? And so then you're, you feel like you can't step into God-given dreams because you feel like lack is the, the wall that you keep hitting. And so here's the thing. What Elizabeth was talking about, what Audrey's talking about, stepping into these God destinies, you are going to need some major kingdom resources. Amen? Yes. Okay, so I guess you're believing small? No. So you're going to need some major kingdom resources, right? Yes. Okay. So that means we need to start getting a revelation on finances. That's right. We need to start understanding the power of surrendered finances to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. Lord, this is yours. What do I do with it? How do I invest it into the kingdom? Where do I sow it? How with finances, Lord? I may not be able to open up doors in my town. I may not be able to force revival to happen. But I have control of my wallet. So you know what? I'm going to start here. I'm going to stretch my faith here. If I don't know how to stretch anybody else's faith, I'm going to stretch my faith in my finances. You know, I believe stepping out in finances is part of slaying the lion and slaying the bear. Because when you start stepping out and say, Lord, I trust you with my finances. You're in charge, so therefore I'm a funnel. And anytime you need to stretch my capacity, see, that's, that's the thing about stretching. What does it do? It stretches, and then you have, what, capacity for more because you've been stretched. That's why God wants to continue to stretch us in giving. Because the more he stretches you in giving, the greater your capacity for him to fill you back up. That's really good, you guys. Hey, we know what this light. Like. Come on, guys, we live this. We go from button up, zip up to elastic. You know this. Come on. Praise God for pantyhose and spanks, okay? So, 
you, you, you take steps of faith. You let God stretch your heart of finances, your belief for finances. And as it gets stretched, as you take big steps of faith, of obedience, asking God, I'm not telling you what your faith step looks like. Right. Oh, faith only has this many zeros to it. Anything less is not faith. No. no. The, middle, the widow gave her two mites. And God says she gave more. Why? Because it was out of the abundance of her believing, right? So it doesn't have to be big. It just has to be done in faith. Let me say that again. It doesn't have to be big. It just has to be done in faith. But can I tell you that sometimes faith says, okay, big is where I need you to go. Big is where I need you to go because I, I have so much stored up, but you don't have room to receive it. Because you haven't been faithful with the little. So if you're faithful with the little, I will be able to stretch you, build and increase your capacity to then give you more. Amen? And that more that you believe for with your finances, guess what? Then as God gives you that, you're able to give and sow back out and God stretches you more and more and more. You know, Andrew talks about that he needs over... At one time it was 11,000. I think it's more (laughs) because we're in budget meetings right now. Uh, uh, $11,000 an hour. And he said that he has he has right now because we're we're building a billion dollar campus and we are building a billion, billion dollar network system to get the gospel out farther and deeper. We're planting more schools getting ready to start more schools and more nations and more states across the United States to raise up disciples and ministers for the end time revival and harvest. Amen. Right? So as we continue to do that, um, where was I going? We need more. So (laughs) the vision is like, oh yeah, Andrew said he has so much peace Right now, more peace than he ever has before. Why? Because a God-sized vision is going to have to be a God-sized provision. And, but when you allow yourself to be stretched, then you refuse to be anxious. So you allow yourself to be stretched. As you get stretched, it just kills worry and anxiousness because as God fulfills his word and brings harvest to your seed, it confirms to you that you can trust in him. So as we give today, I'm just going to tell you, whatever is a step of faith for you, that's the challenge. Because it's not, it's not about money. Andrew always, said, always says this, he's like, I don't need your money. We appreciate it, but we don't need it because God's going to do it. Yes, what we're after, what this is about, is about you leaving here with greater faith. That's what we want. You leaving here stretched to be able to then walk into the more that God has for you. Amen? So let's slay some lions and bears today. Amen? So, Father, we just thank you. I'll let ushers will be able to take this up here in a second. Father, we just thank you that our finances are truly a kingdom principle, that, Lord, you want to increase us and stretch us in so that we have capacity for all the great vision that's in this room, all the signs, wonders, and miracles that are supposed to flow through us to the world. We thank you for this, Lord. So we give today out of faith, not out of obligation, not out of forcing, but we give out of faith. And Lord, you know what faith looks like. And so in that, Lord, I thank you that our hearts are expanding right now in the name of Jesus, preparing for just the harvest of being able to take those things and use what's in our hands greater than ever before. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, praise God. Well, I want to introduce the next speaker. Her name is Carrie Pickett. And... So just to let you know, she's a little crazy. (laughs) Amen. My sisters, we were having lunch yesterday, and they just, they, so when I was talking about the dreams, we won't review it. I refuse to look at my sisters. But they said they all did this at the same time. Oh, God. Oh, God. Amen. So I want to get the privilege of taking 
this conference and kind of putting a dot, dot, dot to it. This is not the end of a conference. It's not a period. It's not an exclamation point. It's not a question mark. It's a dot, dot, dot. Base, basically saying, what are you going to do with this? Right? So what, that, that's, that's the question. What do we do with this now? Because so many times you can hear something and it can encourage and challenge your emotions, but you have to determine, are you going to be a person of action? I wrote something the other day, and maybe some of you have heard me say this in different things, but I want to share something. Um, and it was something that the Lord spoke to me really deeply. And he said this, he said, it's believing that our influence and our purpose are worth doing battle for. Let me say that again. It's believing that our influence and our purpose are doing battle for. It's battle for the influence and impact that we were fashioned for. And to do that, we have to get out of the bubble of self-centeredness and self-focus and ego and pride. You know, when uh, Elizabeth started sharing, you know, uh, that first about humility, you know, humility is this great door opener. I'll just tell you, it's just, it's like God just looks at humility and goes, Oh, I love that. Why? Because humility is the characteristic of Jesus. Who Jesus, giving his life even to the point of death, enduring the shame of the cross, humbled himself, yes. right? Yes. To die for you and I so that we might become and be called children of God. And this dynamic of the humility of Christ, that is something that you have inside of you. You may have never used it, but it's inside of you. Because that's part of the spirit of God. So then we need to say, Lord, teach me how to get out of pride. Because what pride will do, and you, you've, heard, you've heard maybe Andrew share this about pride, is that pride isn't this like, everybody look at me. Psst. I... <laughs> I'm amazing. Like, excuse me, let me fix the day. I'm here, I'm here. Everybody move out of the way. I got this. Guys, that is pride, obviously. We know that. But that's not the only version of pride. The other version of pride is, oh, Lord, you can use someone else. Yep. I don't know. Maybe later, God. Yep. That's pride. Yeah. Because when God speaks something to you, yeah. he's speaking it to you, and we don't get... We're not supposed to. We, we should be dead to self that pride is like, no, pride doesn't have a voice. Pride doesn't get to respond back telling God that God's not able. Because it says that God, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, 6, and 7. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 5, it talks about what? That God resists the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so can I tell you, you can be encouraged, you can get fired up, you can get motivated during this conference, and then walk out in pride saying, well, it won't work for me. Right, that's good, yeah. Don't waste your money coming to a conference. Don't waste your time, don't waste your energy to then put it in a box and say that you're not able to do it. Amen? Amen. Don't let the devil tell you it doesn't work for you. As Elizabeth would say, I do love you. <laughs> you get to decide. You know what? I'm not going to respond with, a, with an argument or an excuse to God. Now, can you ask questions? I think you can ask questions. Yeah. Lord, and that's, and we, we talked about this in Luke. When, when Mary had the angel of the Lord come to her, Elizabeth used this example. I love this. I love this story of Mary, because she asked and said, how shall this be? I've never known a man. Right. I mean, she was just in innocence being like, I think I know enough about babies to know it takes two. Right. 
So how can this be since this hasn't happened? And it's interesting because the Lord then responds to her with this compassion and he responds to her with an answer because it was the condition of the heart in which she asked why. But it's very interesting that Elizabeth's husband, when he got a word that, that his wife was going to have a baby, he laughed. And I don't think it was like, a, <laughs> yes, I think it was like, <laughs> yeah, right. He laughed with disbelief. And you went to the Lord, and he asked the question, well, how can this be? And the Lord said, because of your unbelief. He took his words. He became mute for nine months. Elizabeth's like, I love being pregnant. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> okay, anyway. Um, so, because his, his unbelief was going to continue to speak doubt towards that. Because, as you know, when the seed is planted, it takes a while to see the evidence right, of that seed growing. So, are you pregnant today? I don't see anything. I don't see anything. I don't think it's possible. I mean, how old are you anyway, woman? Right? right? How, am I, how old am I? Right? And so, there's a way how you ask the Lord. You can ask the Lord, really? Really? Yeah. Like, how's that going to happen, God? Like, yeah, your word says this, but, you know, you say healings is, well, how is this that the doctor said? And you can ask with an attitude that's totally in unbelief, right? right. Or we can ask, like Mary, Lord, I don't know how this is going to happen. I would love for you to teach me. Would you show me? So asking questions of the Lord is not automatically unbelief. Because sometimes people will say that obedience, you just obey without any questions. You can have questions, but it's in the spirit of obedience. Lord, okay, absolutely. Can I ask you some things as I go into this? Because I'm not quite sure what this looks like. Right? right? You can ask questions as you go. Okay, Lord, am I doing this right? Hey, well, who do I need to know? What do I need to learn as I do this? Yeah. Versus I got questions and I am not moving until you give me the answers, God. <laughs> well, that's right. the wrong attitude, right? And so what I love about Mary is in Luke chapter 1, verse 45. And this is, this is actually one of my favorite scriptures besides the other 722 pages of my Bible. But this one I really like. But it says here in Luke chapter 1, verse 45, it says, Blessed is, blessed is she, because Elizabeth spoke this over Mary. Blessed is she who believed for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. So let's look at this in a couple different ways. Okay, a couple key things. She was told from the Lord. That is the foundation. Okay, that's the foundation. You were told from the Lord. God spoke to you. And there were promises that he has given you. And I believe that you came here with some promises already in your heart. Yes. There's things that you know God has spoken to you. And so that's the key. You were told from the Lord. Man, that is, that is worse all of our faith. You know what? God said it. I believe it. Right. Right. But that's the key. If God said it, you have to believe it. Because it goes on to say... Blessed is she who believed. So God can say something, but if we don't believe it, yes. right? right? What's in the middle? We want what's in the middle. That those things will be a fulfillment. That there will be fulfillment. We want the fulfillment, right? And sometimes we want to be able to do it without the word from the Lord and without having to believe, but we want the good stuff. And so this powerful principle that you and I are blessed because we believe. Amen. 
And so most people want to walk in the blessing of healing and the blessing of finances and the blessing of destiny and the blessing of peace, right? Like, Lord, I want all these blessings. And the Lord says, they, they belong to you. But you're blessed because you believe that they belong to you. You don't just say, well, it's mine, so I don't have to believe. You just told me it's mine. No, that the, this is the beautiful part of intimacy. He extends all of these things, and then part of our intimacy back with God is we choose to believe. And that what he said, there was a word that the Lord spoke. So that's why when we talk about believing that our influence and our impact are worth doing battle over. Because that's the thing that the enemy is trying to steal from you. Number one, he doesn't want you to have an intimate relationship with him, right? And if you can steal the intimate relationship with him, you don't hear a word from the Lord. So now you're living your own life based on your agenda or your ideas and plans. But relationship always births a voice of the Lord speaking to you. Amen? You'll always get a word from the Lord. I mean, he'll be talking so much. When other people talk to you, you're like, excuse me, you're interrupting God. Like, <laughs> like he gets, you can get to a place where God's just always talking to you. He's always showing you things. You're always in communion and relation. It is not regulated to a short period of time in your daily devotions. If not daily devotions, your monthly devotions. Amen. And it's not regulated that or, or when we're absolutely dry, cracking and splitting open, that then we go to the Lord. <laughs> I need a word. And praise God. If we call upon him, he will answer. He's not looking at you and being like, really? Now you need me? Excuse me, I'll let you be dry a little longer. That's not the heart of God. Man, he he's, he's longs to fill us. But he's not only after your relationship, he's not only after those words of the Lord, because if you start to get a word from the Lord and believe it, then there's fulfillment. There's fulfillment not only in just the inheritance that you possess, healing and prosperity and joy and deliverance and right power and might and ability, but now the kingdom of heaven is being released out of you. The enemy doesn't want that, does he? Oh, he does not want the influence of your relationship with God touching other people. He doesn't want the impact of your life touching other people. So what do you do? You do battle for that influence. Because you know that everything that the enemy's trying to steal, kill, and destroy, what's on the other side of it? A glorious testimony. And that testimony then becomes a megaphone in your hand of you declaring what God is able to do. And it's not just a sermon. It's real life testimony. Amen. Amen. That's what makes it so powerful when you hear stories, when Elizabeth and, and Audrey are talking and they're sharing their life, right? Those aren't just stories. Hey, let's imagine, say, if I had maybe been a missionary someplace. No, it was as a real life story. And it becomes a testimony and there's keys and there's principles throughout that journey that become yes. part of your weaponry. Yes, yes, yes. So unknowingly, this warrior princess thing has become a theme. <laughs> Ninja warrior princess, it, we didn't plan for it. <laughs> I love that. We'll be making some, you know, actually what I really love is that I'm floating off the ground. Oh, Lord. Why do I have a skunk on my back? That's not a skirt. A skunk. No, it's not a skunk. That's a leopard that you wrangled with your bare hands and you skinned it. And then you threw it on and said, who else? That's what that one is. a skunk killing woman you're a leopard killing woman come on <laughs> okay well that's going to distract me okay so I had no idea this was going to become 
a theme. It was just how I was introducing these amazing women of God. But it was interesting because I was sitting there the other day and I was like, Lord, you know, that came out. So what would you say about that? And the Lord said this. It was like this incredible sentence. I was like, why ninja? Why warrior? And why princess? Like, why those words? Why in that order? And the Lord said, it's because you're called to strategic battle. It's strategic battle done by a beloved beauty. It's strategic battle done by a beloved beauty. See, because it's not strong, it's not wrong to be a woman of strength and be a woman of tenderness right. and beauty and intimacy. You can be both and. Yes. Because it's in the place of knowing that you're the beloved right. that you come out with confidence and authority. Right. If you don't know who you belong to and what you possess and who's covering you are under, yes. then you never have the confidence to go into battle. Yes. Because... We don't necessarily, we're not necessarily built for war. We're built for nurturing. Mm. Right. Wow. That's so good. We nurture and we raise up. But we're equipped right. in that nurturing because not only are you called to nurture, you're called to nurture and raise up the warrior spirit. And I'm sorry, mamas, future mamas in this room, Spiritual mamas in this room, man, we get the privilege of raising people up in an identity that helps them go and do battle. Yes. Some people are like, well, I'm not, I'm not up on stage. I don't have a sword. But man, you're nurturing, training, equipping, anointing in your life is part of warring in the spirit. So don't underestimate that. But when you understand the place of being a beloved beauty, that you know that you are loved, you know that you are accepted, you know that you are called, you know that you are chosen. And I'll tell you right there, that's where so many people get hung up. So they're like, great, destiny, whatever. I don't even believe God loves me. Mm. So true. And so that's what the enemy goes after. He wants you to feel like you're a failure and that you're somehow not worthy. Yes. But God, God's not looking for us to love him. We love him only because he first loved us. Right. And when we're asking, Lord, teach me. Show me how much you love me. Lord, I need, to see, I need a revelation of your love. Guys, that is an amazing prayer. That is a lifelong relationship you get to have with the Lord. Because I'll tell you, God's love, the width, the depth, the height, and the breadth. It talks about this in Ephesians 3. Verses 14 and 20, it talks about that, the width, depth, height, and breadth of God's love. And then because of that love, we would become what? Rooted and grounded and established in the love of God. And the love of God surpasses knowledge. Amen? So you can look around you, and knowledge is telling you all kinds of things. But the love of God, you knowing your love to God, surpasses that. I don't care what I see. I don't care what knowledge... What profession, doctor, lawyer, banker, psychiatrist, counselor, police officer has spoken over my life? Yes. Come on. Uh -huh. Why? Because I'm choosing to believe right. what God has spoken about us. That's right. And so the natural can try to rise up, and, and it can have knowledge. It can have a diploma, and it can have the degrees, and it can have the certification and the stamp and the seal of whatever state to confirm that what they're saying is right. No, it's not. Because love surpasses knowledge. So whatever they have said, thank you for your opinion. but I'm choosing to believe love that has the ability to surpass it. Yes. Amen. Amen. And like Audrey was saying, if God's called you to get a certificate, just make sure that your certificate is not the foundation in which you believe. Amen. You need to believe a word from the Lord. And so even with that, if, if that certificate is simply a doorknob, it might be a little screw in the hinge. That's it. That's all it is. It might open doors. But when you go through those doors, you better be bringing the word of the Lord. Because if you bring 
Listen, if you use your certificate, if we use our knowledge, our, our, our educations to bring that to the table, you just brought, no, and please don't shoot, shoot me down here. You're bringing captivity to the table. Because when we, he says, be careful, Colossians chapter 2, verse 8, be careful that you're not taken captive by this world's philosophies, ways and systems of thinking that depend on human tradition rather than the principles of Christ. So yes, God may be using something as a hinge or a doorknob, but when you walk through that door, you better be bringing the word of the Lord because that's really going to be how you help people. Some people do things because they want to help people. You cannot help people by bringing the ways of the world to them. It's not going to help them. Amen. You and I being equipped in the word of God because that's the influence and impact you'll really have. So when we talk about doing battle for that, it's saying, you know what? No matter what comes, right, I'm not letting it steal my calling. I'm not letting it steal my voice. That was one thing. My sister Julie's not here today. She's the one that um, was saved from the dead, from COVID. And um, it's interesting, we were talking the other day because she's also the same sister that had been thrown out of a vehicle and she had rolled the vehicle, it threw her out and then it continued to roll and crush. And she had a brain injury. She ended up dying three times on the flight for life. And so she had this brain injury. And one of the things she said, I, I find it amazing that in every attack of the enemy, there's something he's after. And I said, besides your life? And she said, yeah, besides my life. I said, what's he after? She said, he's after my voice. Because when she had the brain injury, she couldn't form her words. It was part of that supernatural healing that God had to do in her brain for her to be able to think and bring those words back out. And then with COVID, because of the ventilator that was in her throat, it damaged her vocal cords. And so it was really, really raspy. So there's a raspiness, right? And just the, the, the kind of a pain of it. So she's had to go through some different surgeries, but still a little bit of roughness and fatigue that happens to her voice. And she said, I find it that every time the enemy's trying to steal my voice. I said, and? And she goes, well, obviously he can't have it. <laughs> so my sister Julie is actually getting ready to do some television programs with me where she is going to share her testimony and she's going to put it towards and she's like, but I'm going to cry the whole time. And I'm like, and I will too. So we'll just <laughs> cry on TV together. Right? I said, okay, so start now. Start now. Don't wait until perfect healing. You start now. Start using your voice, whether raspy or not. Start using it now. Right? And that's what, that's what Elizabeth has been sharing. That's what Audrey's been sharing. You use what you have now. Don't just say, okay. Right? You actually start to move with it. So do battle over it. So one of the things I want to share and um, in my remaining time with you, and Elizabeth started to share this here at the end, but you can't do the battle and you can't have the confidence if you don't have a relationship with the word of God. And this is more than just, you guys need to get into the word. That sounds really great. What does that mean? What does it mean to get into the word, right? Well, one of the things of getting into the word is the attitude in which you approach the word. If you don't have the right attitude in approaching it, getting into it is just religious tradition. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And it's boring and it's dry and it's confusing and you're like, ah, right? And then obviously I'm not spiritual enough because everybody that's spiritual is saying to get in it and they think it's great, but I don't get it. So I guess God's not called me, right? And so you, the way you get into the word is how you approach it, your attitude towards it. And you got to realize that it is spirit and it is life. Jesus said, the words I speak to you, John chapter 6, verse 63, he says, the words I speak to you, they are spirit and they are life. And I think it's in verse 64. I'm not sure a different version say a different one. It is the spirit who gives life and the flesh profits nothing. Okay. 
in, I think it's the NIV. It says, the, the spirit gives life. The words I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And he says, the flesh profits nothing. Yeah, there we go. The flesh counts for nothing. See, you and I walking and living in the spirit, it counts as nothing. That's why we want to be careful that what we're building and what we labor towards and what we serve and what we give our days and our time and our attention and our affections to, that it's not of the flesh. Amen? And people can be so overwhelmed, so consumed, so like, oh my gosh, my life is so busy. But guess what? At the end of the day, it's going to burn up. It's going to burn up as wood and hay and stubble. There will be a judgment day. Every single one of us will stand before the Lord. Every single one of us. And actually, there's two judgments. There's a judgment of, have we received Jesus? Have we received him? And I'll tell you right there, when you receive Jesus, praise God, you and I are able to have eternal life. Right? He separates the sheep from the goats, those who chose him and those who didn't. And those who didn't, for them is prepared a judgment of everlasting punishment that wasn't intended for mankind. It was intended for the enemy and his demons. But yet, if we don't choose life, we've chosen, chosen death, right? But it also says that we will stand in every good thing that we have done. Every work that we will do, be done will be brought before the fire. And those things which are of the Spirit, are of the Lord, of the will of God, it will come out, and some of it will be like gold, and some of it will be like silver, because it was the things of the Lord that we were doing. And then there's some, it says it will be burned up as hay, wood, and stubble. It was just of the flesh. It was just of our own strength. And it says those will enter into eternal rest, and it says by the skin of their teeth. Basically, Jesus and Jesus alone got you into heaven because you didn't do anything good to get there on your own. And not that the good stuff we do gives us more credit. It's just that in, it's just a demonstration. It's just a reflection that while we lived here on earth, we lived after the spirit. That's awesome. You want to come out of the fire as this big hunk of gold. Hallelujah. (laughs) Right? The good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. That's what you lived. And so what we got to do, what, that's, this is what's powerful, that when we go to the word of God, we're bringing our lives to the word of God and saying, is this of the flesh, is this of the spirit? Father, let this, the word, this fire, burn up things in me, the flesh in me now. I don't want to wait till heaven. Man, burn it off now. Come on, let's do some pruning now. Let's, let, let's have transformation now. I don't wait till heaven. Man, Heaven on earth. Literally. You bring heaven on earth. People say, well, that's a really naive comment because, you know, in this world, there will be persecutions. Yes. So face it with the kingdom of God. Yeah, there'll be persecutions. Rejoice when you are in persecution. Rejoice when you are persecuted. Why? Because you're like, (laughs) oh, watch this persecution. Why? Because you were responding to it. It was like, listen, I don't care if you're mocking me. I don't care if you're trying to take my home. I don't care if you're trying to, to slander me. Man, I know how God sees me. Man, you can rejoice because the persecution doesn't have strength. It doesn't have a voice. It doesn't have authority. So you can look at persecution and be like, I can rejoice even in the midst of persecution because I know what it really is. Yes. It's not my identity. It's not trying to steal my identity and my purpose. And no, I know what my purpose is. And man, your persecution, thank you very much for making a confirmation that I'm at the right place at the right time doing the right thing. Thank you, persecution. Woo-hoo! Does that make sense? It's an attitude of like, then when you go to the word of God and how you approach the word of God, you're saying, listen, this is not a religious activity. I'm coming to it knowing it it possesses life and it also has an effect if I'm able to bring every part of my life to it. So it's not only a law of liberty, it's not only the mirror reflecting back to you all that you are, as you stand before the word of God, as you immerse yourself in the word of God, everything that you are gets dealt with in the word of God. And it becomes the pruning shears, those vine dresser, right? The vine dresser of the word, the work of the Holy Spirit starts to then create this beautiful vineyard of the fruitfulness of your life. 
It says here, in Psalms 32, in verse 8, it says, and this is what's so powerful, like this, when we approach the word of God, we don't just see it as like, what am I trying to get? We need to look at it in this way, and this is what the, the, the Lord says. <clears throat> he says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. You go to the word of God with this expectancy that it's going to teach you in the way you should go. That you're saying, Lord, I, here's the situation. Here's this emotion. Here's this question. Here's this opportunity. Here's this diagnosis. I bring it to you, and Lord, I bring it to the word of God. And I believe that as I open this word, you're going to teach me and lead me in the way I should go. That's, that's, that's the faith we get to have in the relationship with the word of God. And you may say, I don't know where to start. I don't even know how to define it. So can I say, that's why we created Cares Bible College. And this is not a shameless plug. No. Our goal and the way we've built the word of God is what are the foundations of the word? Line upon line, principles upon principles. Not religion, getting us out of religion into relationship. What are the foundations of the finished work of the cross? What he did, who you are, what you possess, and what you can do. That's Karis Bible College. Amen? And if we can get a hold of that, amen, then the word comes alive. It's, it's like what Julianne said. Man, you know what? Can I tell you something about Julianne? Isn't it amazing when you're up there? You didn't just see a spiritual transformation. Did you see the transformation of this woman? Dear Lord. I was looking at her. I was like, hottie on the stage. Right? Come on. Because what happens is when the word sets you free on the inside, man, it transforms everything even on the outside. Because life just produces, there's this multiple, there's this, there's this overflow of because you understand your identity, then you really start releasing the real beauty of the Lord. You can do makeup and hair and all day long and be ugly, be a, a whitewashed sepulcher full of dead man's bones. Amen. And praise God, you and I can release the beauty of an identity that's established in Christ. He says, I will guide you with mine eye. And you might have heard me say this before, but it's the dynamic of, you know how when you lead a two-year-old, come on moms, and they're like, la, 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 and ooh, gum. <laughs> right? And you're like, come on, right? And you're trying to pick them up, and they're just, and finally you just... <laughs> Come on, it's faster, right? Yes? Kids, grandkids, babysitting? Yes, we know it, right? Praise God. In our immaturity, in our newness, in, in what we're continuing to grow in with the Lord, the Lord will take us by the hand and he'll lead us and guide us. And sometimes we get distracted by stuff and God's just like, no, come on, come on. He will not force you. He doesn't jerk you. I said, no, right? Have you ever seen a parent do that? You know, <laughs> right? To their kid. God, God's not doing that. He's leading you. I'll take you by the hand and I will lead you. But what I love about this verse, it says, I will lead you with my eye. I will guide you with my eye. And that's the aspect where you're so focused on God. You're so beholding him. You're so abiding in him that when he looks a direction, man, your heart just follows, right? Because you're so focused on the face of your lover. As so we talked about the first night, you're so focused on who he is and how he sees you. And you're so watching, you're so consumed with him that when he looks at something, man, you're able to look and follow that. And you may say, well, Carrie, I've got a husband, I've got meals, I've got laundry, I've got groceries, I've got a profession, I've got talents, I've got stuff. How am I supposed to just look on the Lord? Listen, do you know you can be consumed with God? Absolutely consumed with God. Okay, how do I want to do this? Miss Elizabeth, can you come up here? Audrey, can you come up here? Israel, Stacy, Maria, Ellie, 
Moki. Okay. I'm going to make Elizabeth God because it just yes. seems right. <laughs> I'm going to make you God. God. You oh. represent God. <laughs> All right? Here's the thing. You've got the husband and the finances and the kids. This is my daughter, Eliana. <laughs> and this is my niece, Micaiah. And this is my other daughter that doesn't belong to me, that belongs to God. <laughs> All right, so you can have children and you can have husbands and you can have finances, you can have all these things. And listen, all of them are important and all of them are beautiful, aren't they? They're absolutely important in your life. And you may say, but Lord, I love you. I really, really love you, but I've got to take care of this man. Well, you know. I'm a man. Okay, I understand. What she represents in this, in this you know, thing. <laughs> okay, and the, and the children and the finances, and right? All of these things. And you're saying, Lord, I really love you, but I got all these other things. And so you're trying to focus because you're trying to use your relationship with God. So you get it, you fill up, and then you try to give out and 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 give out, and give out right? <laughs> Right? And you're trying to sow into it and you're trying to do it. But so many often we're doing it in our own strength, asking, Lord, help me. Hey, come on. Hey, 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 hey. Right? <laughs> but do you know how you stay so focused on the Lord where he leads you and guides you? Is because you put him first and then everything else comes behind it. Right? Everything else gets in line. And then guess what? You see everything through the light of your relationship with God. You see everything and you move, you live and move and have your being because he's in you. And so because he's in you, because he's equipping you, now because out of this relationship, sorry, okay? <laughs> no, that's fine. No. <laughs> okay, because of this relationship, <laughs> I don't want to see that up there, okay? <laughs> then you can, what? You can operate now to the power of God and the anointing of God and from the strength of your relationship with God. Amen? Thank Amen. you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. Sorry, I poked you there, didn't I? Sorry, I think I stabbed you, Audrey, with my fake nail. Sorry. Amen? It's just, it's how you do it. And then when God looks at something, when God, because sometimes there's times that it feels like you're investing a lot into a certain sphere of your life, right? Yes. It seems to be a season of such intense focus, intense battle. So does that mean that area of your life is broken and dysfunctional? No, it just means that you need to have such a relationship with the Lord. So you're saying, Lord, obviously you know this is going on, so I'm going to look it through you, and as you look at this situation, I'm just going to follow and get your gaze and your perspective on it. Right. That's good. Amen. So I'm not minimizing the multitudes of callings you already possess and already do. See, we can talk about finding your destiny and doing these things and living out your purpose. So many of you are right smack in the middle of so many things you're called to do. You're called to be a mom. You're called to be a wife. You're called to be a teacher. You're called to be a servant. You're called to be a friend. You're right in the middle of so many powerful callings. And if you abandon them and don't do them, you're not faithful in those things, and there's not more. Sorry, there's not more. Because if you abandon what you have, and you just say, oh, I, just, I throw my hands up, whatever. God, just call me in a great destiny over here. No, this, I'll tell you right now, your marriage, your family, your children, your, your singleness, mm -hmm. if you can let God rule and reign in that, that's your platform for so much of the ministry God has you doing. And that doesn't mean that it has to be perfect. 
God is not asking for perfect marriages in this room. And so many of you have not fulfilled, have not stepped into more of what God has for you because you feel like your marriage is not perfect, therefore nothing else could be. And the enemy will tell you, you can't even do this well. What makes you think you can do other things well? Listen, this is the thing about marriage, is it takes two to make a marriage work. So you do your part. You do your part. You get so focused on the Lord that then the strength of your relationship with God is anointed to do your part. And you are not the Holy Spirit. I know we think we are. But you are not the Holy Spirit and you cannot force the change in your spouse. And so there's a place of, yes, it's my ministry. I get to serve it. But at the end of the day, listen, honey, you will stand before God Almighty on your own. Yes. Just like I will. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. And you've made excuses not fulfilling your destiny because you're trying to fulfill his destiny. I love all the husbands watching. <laughs> and that's why, that's why they need to come to the men's conference. Right, so they can be encouraged to get out of the flesh. Because sometimes the flesh is just them striving to try to make sure they're the providers, trying, striving so hard to do what is expected of them or whatever version of a man the world says you have to. They're striving so hard and they're, they're, they're exhausted. Right? And so they need to be reminded. And praise God, you can remind, but you remind led by the Lord. Not like, excuse me, honey. You know what Carrie Pickett says? That you, you shouldn't, no. Please don't bring my name into it. Please. You know Andrew Womack says, right? No. Honey, this is what the Lord's showing me and teaching me. And you speak life over him. Man, there's life and death in the power of your tongue. There's life and death of how you speak over all the things within your life. And when we're talking about a relationship with the Word of God, you go to it with this approach of expectancy, knowing it's your hope, knowing it's your source of freedom, but also it is where transformation happens. So you go looking for transformation. Can I encourage you? Do never, ever, and this is, thus says Carrie, but this not says the Lord, but I think it's good. Never go to the Word of God without a pen and paper. Yeah. Or without something to take notes. Yeah. Because what you're doing, you're saying, Lord, I'm believing you're going to speak to me. I'm believing for direction and guidance and revelation. If you get a picture, you draw it out, you paint it out. You go to the word of God because you know that you can expect something from it. That's why, you know, so, so many times we want to know everything. We want to know, and again, this is our tendency as women. We want to know all the domino pieces right? Want all the domino pieces, mm, and God shows us, or we want God to show us, so that we can say, great, I love the domino pieces. Could we rearrange the format of them? <laughs> right? Because sometimes, somehow we think that our calling and destiny is something that we get to negotiate on. No, it's something that you obey, you live, and you surrender to. But I will say this, because some of you may be feeling frustrated. Great. I'd love to fulfill a destiny. I've asked the Lord, but he's not showing me. Anybody like that in the room? I don't know the full picture. I don't know. I want to know. I, I'll obey it if I know. Can I encourage you that if you know right now what you're supposed to do, do right now. Because it says in Psalms 119 verse 105, it says, Your word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Sometimes all you see is the next step. The word of God illuminates just the next step. And guess what? The next step can be good enough, powerful enough. Maybe a big step. You're like, whoa, can I see the rest of the path? God's like, just take the first step, baby. Just trust me with the first step, right? And the word of God illuminates what is possible within that step. And within the illumination of that step is the source of the power, is his light. The word is a lamp unto my feet and a light into my path. It has the ability to reveal. So if you're trying to figure it out on your own, it's going to continually feel like darkness. 
But as we get into a relationship with the word, you get excited because you're like, if it's just one promise, okay, it's one promise. I may want a hundred, but God's like, you don't need a hundred. You just need one. Just one. We said it the other day. Sometimes all it takes is one revelation to change everything. You don't need to have the whole Bible memorized. Just get your rhema word from the Lord and stand on it. Get your word from the Lord. Believe in your heart. Blessed is she who believes because there will be a fulfillment of the word that was spoken to her. Amen. Amen. You choose to believe it. And this is what we each get to do. When you look at the word of God, I want to do this real quick before we end. In Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, it's not only your relationship with the word of God, but it's the relationship because it's living and active, the relationship the word wants to have with you. So in Isaiah chapter 30, verse 21, your ears shall hear a word behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. This is the way. Sorry. (laughs) Nobody watches the Mandalorian? Okay, never mind. This is the way. (laughs) Walk in it whenever you turn to the right hand or whenever you turn to the left. See, this this is the power of God's word that you put inside of you. It becomes a language that when you hear it, this is the way. Walk in it. So when you're spending time in the word of God, you are learning the language, right? Elizabeth knows four and five languages, Right? So if you start, you know, ranting off in Spanish and being rude, she'll stand up and be like, right? I'll be like, oh, hi, you speaking in tongues? (laughs) I won't know. And she'll be like, security. (laughs) Okay? When you understand a language, there's a response to it. If you don't have the language of the word of God in your heart, there's no response. And if you don't hear the word of God, you don't know what direction to go. Because God's speaking, you're asking him, God, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to do? And God's trying to speak his word, but you've never learned the language. I share this all the time. When I started to learn Russian, I didn't know what people were saying. I was like a a silent bubble. It was just gibberish around me. But the longer that I was in Russia, 16 years in Russia, guess what? I learned Russian. And I would be talking to someone and I could hear a student behind me say something dumb and be like, oh man, I have to deal with that now. Why? Because my ears, as I was talking here, started to hear, started to be able to pick up all these side conversations. Why? Because my ear was now in tune to what they were saying, where before it was just ambient noise, white noise in the room. Now I was understanding. It's the same way. You You have life happening all around you. And then the word of God speaks to you. This is the way. This is what to do. This is how to do it. That's how. That's how we fulfill. That's how we take our one talent or our two or our five. Or we take those things and we say, what do I do with it? And we're hearing the word of God. The word of God is speaking that language to us. Amen. We have shared so many principles. And... This time isn't a time, and I pray that you have not felt condemned. That's not, that's not why we're up here, to condemn. Come on, girls, stop being stupid. No. But in love, come on, girls, let's stop being stupid. <laughs> right? Because if we don't preach to our flesh, who will? Right? If we don't, if we don't go, okay. All right, start over, redo. Okay, new. You know what? At any time, you can start over. Any time. Any time you can decide to do things different. But what pride will do is tell you, if you go home and try to be all of a sudden a new version of mom and a new version of wife, they're going to be like, really? This is just conference high. (laughs) That's all this is. Because back after... You know, the weekend, right? Get to Wednesday, it's, you're going to be same old wicked witch of the West. <laughs> right? Come on. Pride will tell you that this won't last. That this was good, but yeah, they don't know what I'm going back to. You decide what you're going back to. 
You decide from this conference what you're going back to. You decide, you can't change them, but you've changed you. And now the way you respond, the way you flow, the way you react, the way you view can be different if you allow the word of God to take effect and you believe what God spoke to you. God spoke all kinds of different things to you. God spoke things to you that we never said. Amen? That's awesome because you put yourself in an environment to open up your heart. And there's things that God pricked on your heart. You didn't hear the next three or four sentences of whoever or of whatever they said because God was speaking to you, right? God spoke to you. Now will you believe? Because if you choose to believe, there will be a fulfillment of the word that God spoke to you during this time. So I'm going to encourage you guys, um, and this is, um, this is not me trying to push a sell of a product, but can I encourage you to get the conference on CD or USB or flash drive or tablets engraved in stone, however you need to get it. <laughs> uh, all kinds of versions out there. Um, because this is something that, again, you kind of feel like, oh, prick, prick, oh, oh, oh. And maybe you didn't hear the next two or three sentences. And God needs you to hear those things again. He needs you to stir up your heart with these verses and these scriptures of what God was speaking to you this weekend. Like we said, we don't talk, we didn't talk about what we were going to share. We didn't compare verses and scriptures and like, hey, you get them this way and I'll get them that way and then I'll get them over here. We didn't talk about that. We just automatically knew how to do that, right? right? Because the Holy Spirit was ministering to you guys during this time. We want to thank you for the privilege of being able to minister to you. Thank you for having a heart that even though you don't really know us, you opened your heart to receive from us. It takes a lot of trust, and we want to say thank you for that. Because ultimately, at the end of the day, though, dot, dot, dot. What are you going to do with it? There's some of you that may be leaving right away, but if not, I want to encourage you to please stay for after lunch. Stay for the Q&A because there's so much wisdom. There's so many nuggets that come out of that Q&A time. There's so many times someone will say something, even someone will ask me a question that is prompted by their heart cry and the spirit of God in me will answer it and I'm taking notes on it going, that's good, God, and it ministers to me. So we want to be able to do that together. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have ministry time. We're going to have ministry time that whether from stage calling up or you taking a stand or different things God's wanting to do within your heart, that ministry time is going to be really key for some remaining things God's wanting to do with you this afternoon. And then we're going to end with worship. Because let's put an exclamation point. Yes on these things and seal it just in worship and praise that we're going home different. So, God has spoken to you. Will you believe? Amen. So we, can I have you stand up? We're going to close in prayer. And then I'm going to have Tracy come up. So if there's any last minute things to share. But let me pray. Lord, I thank you that you have spoken things to us. And you know what those are. Think about them right now. What are you standing for? What has God spoken to you? What's God spoken to you? Okay. You know what it is. So, Lord, we believe. And we may have some questions like, Lord, how? But it's not asked with an attitude. It's not asked with frustration. It's not asked with disbelief. We want to obey today. We want to believe. And so, Lord, if there is doubt or unbelief within us, then, Lord, how, how could you teach me? Give me the strength to take the step of faith, knowing that your word is a lamp unto my feet. Lord, we thank you for this. We thank you for what you have stirred up through all of the sessions here, through all of the workshops through all of the worship services, through all of the prayer ministry time, through the parking attendance, to serving out on the mezzanine, to people who were taking care of the ice. We have received throughout this conference by multiple people. And so Lord, thank you for ministering to us so faithfully. 
And Lord, we want to respond, so we choose to believe. And it doesn't have to feel like this grand, huge cry of a warrior. It can just be, Lord, a sigh of, I surrender. I believe. So, Lord, we thank you for the fulfillment of these things that you have spoken. Lord, we thank you for the fulfillment of these things which you have spoken. Lord, we praise you for the fulfillment of these things you have spoken within our lives. Amen? Rejoice. Rejoice. You know, it's important, you know, you can be a, I was, who was I telling the other day? I, was, I forget who I was saying this to. Oh, I was talking to my sister. And it was the dynamic of we have to choose on this side of the Red Sea, not the other side. We choose on this side of the Red Sea. God, there's a sea before me. I can't wait to see how you get me across. You can pick me up and toss me over. You can helicopter me over. You can put me in a submarine and take me through it. Right? You can split it wide open. Amen? Amen. So I'm rejoicing because I know you're going to do it. How you do it, I don't know, but I'm rejoicing on this side that it is done. Amen? So... I'm going to have Miss uh, Tracy come up and give our parting any announcements.